Give us peace. Be with us. Let us hear your words, not my own, God. Speak to us in your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to read another scripture, if you haven't had enough already. Um, This one we'll be more comfortable with as it comes from the Gospel of Luke, uh, chapter 5. I hope that I have the right version um, for this. Uh, But if I don't, then you'll just have to read in between the lines. They're intelligent people. You can keep up. Um, This is Luke, chapter 5, verse 12 to 16. Jesus was in one of the towns where there was also a man covered with a skin disease. When he saw Jesus, he fell on his face and begged, Lord, if you want, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched him and said, I do be clean. Instantly, the skin disease left him. Jesus ordered him not to tell anyone. Instead, Jesus said, Go and show yourself to the priest and make an offering for your cleansing as Moses instructed. This will be a testimony to them. News of him, that is Jesus, spread even more, and huge crowds gathered to listen and to be healed of their illnesses. But Jesus would withdraw to deserted places for prayer. The Word of God for the people of God. So I am, if you don't know me, uh, my name is Thomas. Uh, I am currently officially a student pastor of this church. Um, It's one of my classes this semester. I am attending seminary uh, full-time right now. I am also a full-time father to my two-year-old who was uh, distracting me during children's moment. Um, That's what children are for after all, it seems. And so I am uh, here to share with you some of the things that uh, I've been kind of uncovered in my studies this week um, about this passage and uh, about the passage in Leviticus. If you don't see how they're tied together right now, um, hopefully you will by the end of this um, if it's not obvious. Um, So the Gospel of Luke, let's begin there, is full of healings. If you read Luke, just healings. Jesus goes and heals and goes and heals and goes and heals and goes and heals and then he says some things. And then he goes and heals and he goes and heals and he goes and heals. That's how the Gospel of Luke really works when you break it down. Uh, and so this story is actually one of two different times in the Gospel of Luke where Jesus heals someone specifically with a skin disease. The other is in chapter 17, and uh, we're familiar with that story. That's where Jesus heals 10 uh, lepers, uh, usually how we hear it, hear it talked about. But uh, it's not specifically leprosy, as in the medical defined Hansen's disease. Uh, it's just a general skin disease. They were not that advanced in medicine as we are now back then. And so uh, this word that's generally translated leprosy is, is also uh, relevantly translated skin disease. And that's part of the reason why I went with this uh, translation for this gospel passage. Um, And so uh, in this story, these lepers, only one of them turns around and thanks Jesus. And it's the Samaritan, which is a foreigner. And Jesus, we all know the story. Yes, you're with me. Um, And I mention this one because it's important to realize that these are two different stories. One happens toward the beginning of the Gospel of Luke. And one happens closer toward the end. And each different story reveals different things about God and us. Now, this story begins a little curiously. The sick man is described as being in the town. And now in Leviticus, since we're all experts in that now, um, before this morning's reading in chapter 13, back up one chapter, uh, there are regulations about what to do when a skin disease appears. Chapter 14 is about what you do when you're healed of the skin disease. So that's the contrast there. And chapter 13 summarizes the life of an infected person like this. This is uh, verse 45 and 46 in chapter 13. 
As for the diseased person who has the infection, his clothes must be torn, the hair on his head must be unbound, he must cover his mustache, and he must call out, Unclean! Unclean! The whole time he has the infection, he will be continually unclean. He must live in isolation, and his place of residence must be outside the camp. This man, then, in the middle of town, is in flagrant defiance of this law. It seems likely his condition is visible uh, to the naked eye, maybe even obvious, because Luke mentions the extent of the, the disease. He's covered with it. And so, has he been calling out, unclean, unclean, as he walks through this town? Imagine his humiliation. Furthermore, if this is his hometown that we're talking about here, it doesn't have to be, then he probably knows virtually everyone he's encountering in his brash search for Jesus. And so we should pause briefly here to talk about the idea of clean and unclean, since it's important to this message and fundamental to the book of Leviticus. There is nothing wrong, sinful, or embarrassing about being unclean. It's just a state of being, as is being clean. Common things can be clean or unclean, and commonly a person would alternate between those two different states. The major difference between clean and unclean is that in order to be something, sorry, the something that is unclean cannot be sanctified in order to be made holy. You must first become clean before you can be made holy. In practice, what that means uh, is the holiness of God's presence would eradicate, it would destroy anything that was unclean. And so, if you were unclean, you could not worship God in the tabernacle or in the temple at the risk of your own life. So, it's also worth noting the Pharisees, during Jesus' time, believed that the Messiah would only come if all of Israel were clean. And so there are those in Israel who are blaming important things on this man and those who are like him, which they were just not responsible for. Now, there is something unique about this man's situation with a skin disease, specifically. This type of uncleanness is not shed easily. Many, most cases of being unclean are temporary. A bath at the end of the day is usually enough to make someone clean again. But his uncleanness is ongoing. Thus, when he approaches Jesus, he does not ask to be healed. Notice that. He asks to be made clean. He's, his concern is not his sickness, but his state before God. In response, Christ touches this man. This too is surprising. Leviticus says even touching something which is unclean makes the one who touched unclean too. Now, we should not belabor this point too much. Jesus' willingness to become unclean on account of this person should not be too surprising if being temporarily unclean is not that big of a deal. What is surprising is somehow through this touch and through these words, Jesus cleanses the man. This is just not how things work. I considered this action a couple of different ways. Is Christ so pure that in touching this man, his cleanness spreads and purifies the man too? Or does Jesus touch and give his cleanness to the man and take on his uncleanness? 
I've prepared a helpful visual aid. And uh, in my estimation, this counts as uh, overanalyzing something. Um, but these are the two things that I basically said. This is uh, my fantastic artistry on display here. I am a natural artist just like my sister. Um, but you can see uh, Jesus would be the top hand, and the man on the bottom is the unclean hand. Uh, and then, so either Jesus purifies the man, or Jesus exchanges his cleanness with his uncleanness. Now, as I said, I think this is overanalyzing what's going on here. Um, but, uh, so I, and I don't think the mechanics as to what happened exactly really matter, uh, but both of those say something meaningful about the nature of Jesus and God. Jesus charges the now clean man to make an offering as Moses commanded. And this is where the connection to Leviticus comes in. This is the offering that we read from Leviticus, and I will point out that that's only about half of the total verses to the offering. The next section talks about what to do if you can't afford the offering, and Jill's nodding because she read ahead and saw it. And so there's actually provision within this provision of God for people who can't afford to do all of the extents of that, uh, of that original offering, as complicated as it was. Uh, but if the man is clean, clean already, then why send him to the priests? And at a minimum, Luke says it's to witness to the priests. This is a part of the man's testimony, to be a witness to them. But what is the purpose of the complicated ritual then? And each part of the ceremony, we're going to go through it a little bit here, is kind of paralleled in another portion of Leviticus that gives the reason behind these different instances. This is basically an agglomeration of different ceremonies and pieces in Leviticus that have been smashed together into this one ceremony for cleansing for skin disease. Now, the offering, the first offering that was made on the first day, was made with two birds. I'm sure you'll remember there's that weird part where they... Yeah, right? Yeah, okay. Um, but the slaying of one and releasing the other is similar to the offering made at the Day of Atonement. Now, the purpose of the Day of Atonement was to cleanse the entirety of Israel from the very high priest to the widow. God knew, when he set out these rules and regulations, that not all of Israel's faithfulness, not all of Israel's faithlessness would be cleaned. It would not all be ritually cleaned. There would be things that would be forgotten. There would be things that would be unnoticed. And so the Day of Atonement was an annual catch-all event to cover all of Israel's uncleanness. Yom Kippur is still the holiest day of the year in Judaism and was actually observed this past Wednesday. It happened this week. Go figure that these things kind of line up. The sacrifice on the Day of Atonement involved two goats, one of which was offered as a sin offering, just like the first bird was. It was slaughtered. The other goat was left alive. The high priest placed all of the sins of Israel onto the head of the goat. And then they would release the goat into the wilderness and taking away the rest of the sin of Israel. We called that goat the scapegoat. That's where we get the term from. And just like the birds here. The middle section about bathing is a common ritual for cleansing what has been unclean. It comes up very often, uh, and it was pretty short in that passage, so we're not going to make a big deal out of it. Now, the offering made on the eighth day was made with rams and a lamb. And this is basically a guilt offering, and that comes from Leviticus 5, 6, and 7. Um, and... So it's, it's basically to make right, to, to atone for the guilt of specific sins. So we've got the Day of Atonement, the guilt offering, and then there's this strange part about placing blood and oil on the ear and the thumb and the toe, right? Very strange. What is that about? And that's actually from the ritual for the ordination of priests. 
if you find the part where Moses, where Aaron and his sons are ordained priests in Leviticus, Moses does the same thing to them. He places blood on their earlobe, on their thumbs, and on their toes. And so, uh, what is the meaning of doing it to someone who has been, uh, who has had a, a skin disease? And it's because they've been cast outside of the camp. They've been made into a part separate from Israel. They've been kicked out of the country, basically. They are no longer a part of Israel. And Israel's purpose, and this is from Exodus, was to serve as a kingdom of priests to the nations. It was so that the other nations would come to know who Yahweh is. And so now that this person is clean again, they can rejoin the priesthood of Israel. We now see that this cleansing achieves much more than just a physical healing. Jesus restores the man's relationship with God. Because he is clean, he can return to worship in the presence of Yahweh. Jesus restores the man's relationship with his community. Because he is clean, he can return to his home inside the city. Jesus restores the man's identity. Because he is clean, he is again included as part of the nation of Israel. And Jesus restores the man's calling. Because he is clean, he can serve as Israel was intended, as an ambassador to the nations, so they may know Yahweh. We must cast now our vision forward. Because Jesus is still alive today and is here now. Our uncleanness runs deeper than our skin. And we're pretty good about dressing it up, making it seem pretty even. But it remains that there is something rotten at our core. And worse, we are powerless against it. Our sins do not make us sinners. But instead, we are sinners, and this root causes our sin. We see the effects everywhere in our lives. What a wonderful thing to have children in service. We see the effects everywhere in our lives. We treat other things as if they were gods. Our relationships with our family and our friends are splintered and broken. We've forgotten who we are. And while we may be busier than ever, it is often just a distraction from how lost and without purpose we feel. But Jesus can make us clean. Christ has the power. And Jesus wants that for all of us. Jesus is the final offering of atonement, the perfect sacrifice for all time. The blood of Jesus on the cross covers all of our sin, and his resurrection proclaims that even death has been defeated. We are no longer trapped in our sins, but made free through him and in him. The moment we make him our Lord and Savior, we begin our path back to love that makes us holy. And while that first cleansing may happen in an instant, there may be difficult and costly things we need to follow through with to restore our relationships, to restore our identity, restore our purpose. The truth is, most of us Christians, myself included, protect old pieces of sin in myself, in ourselves. To identify them requires deep self-inspection. Maybe I need to cut out things that I've placed over God. Things which have owned my love wrongfully. And in doing so, I must destroy an old part of myself. Perhaps I have a splintered relationship 
which needs an attempt at reconciliation. And to do so on some level means that I have to relive that pain that caused the break originally. Maybe I need to slow down enough to admit that I'm lost. To know the chaos that is inside myself before God can fill it with new purpose. And I'm saying I while I talk about this, but in truth, Christianity never happens in a vacuum. So we should always ask ourselves, how do we do this as a community? with the people closest around us. One thing is certain, though. When we have finished these painful tasks of self-inspection, cleansing, and offering, and growth, they will become a part of our witness, our testimony of who Jesus is to others. Let us pray. God, make us like you. Uncompromisingly. Show us the parts of ourselves that are unclean, that are in your way. Help us to remove them. Clean them for us. Purify us. For you, Lord. We know you want to. Help us to want to as well. In Jesus' name, amen.